Hello and welcome to the Salty Cob Podcast. I am your host, Caitlin Creeper, and I am here today with Marie Philippe Jean. Marie, thank you so much for being here today. We're so happy to have you. That was so good. I know you were nervous about pronouncing my very French name, but you did perfectly. <laughs> thank you so much for having me. I know it's been a long time coming because I've been following you for so many years on social media. So it's nice to connect and I'm really, I feel honored to be a guest on the Salty podcast. Yeah, I mean, as I said last time we spoke, I feel like we've been circling around each other for a long time. So it's a real honor to be able to sit down with you and also having witnessed a few evolutions from afar. And I'm excited that we get to sit down and and talk about Mm. that today. So for our listeners who who Mm -hmm. don't know you yet, maybe you can share a little bit about who you are and what you do. Okay, perfect. Um, so I, you will hear in my accent and I will ask for your patience and indulgence as I've been working in French the whole week. So my, I might need some time to just switch my brain. I'm a French Canadian. I'm based, I was based in Montreal for the past 15 years, but I just bought a house up north. I am from nature. I'm from a very small town in Quebec. I grew up by the water, by the mountains. So I just, I'm returning, like I'm I'm doing this big return to where I'm from. It's a different region, but it's just coming back to nature. Um, and I've been evolving in two spaces um, in the past decade, I would say. I work in the television industry. I started out as a host for teenagers. I was doing web series and web shows for teens, which was super fun. And then I evolved into writing and producing while also being a fitness trainer, a movement teacher. Um, in Quebec, online, in parks. Um, And I think these these two things um, nourish each other, movement and storytelling. For me, they go hand in hand. Um, So yeah, that's where I'm coming from. And in in the the salty universe, I am coming to you also as a friend to Erika. We've been friends for many years. We've traveled together. And that's how I've connected to this community. And that's how I've, I've come to know you as well. Was that a good resume? Yes. <laughs> <That's>, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for that. And I think that's really interesting, that piece about movement and storytelling, because it's not often I see kind of linked together. So when did that kind of come up for you to link the movement and the storytelling? And why do you think they go hand in hand? Hmm. Um, I grew up as a figure skater. I think doing a sport for many years that requires you some artistry, creativity, grace, but also requires you to be powerful, to gain speed, um, to be extremely technical, I think helped me understand that these two forces could coexist. Because sometimes in the school system, I find that we put kids into boxes. You're either very creative and very artistic or you're very physical and you're into sports and we separate these two things. But I think through figure skating, I really understood that they could go hand in hand. And then in the work place, I found that if I didn't have my movement practice, if I didn't have space to just let ideas flow in a run or just through a flow on my mat, I was not doing good in my writing work. I needed these tools to then be good at a brainstorm session or to be able to really write what I was, to be honest in my writing. So I think I was connecting the two just in my private practice. And then I started bringing that to businesses through workshops or to through um, in retreats and so on. So now I think I'm helping bridging that more and more and people are understanding that movement creates the space necessary to just be ready to be creative and have the courage to bring your ideas forward, which I think is what we also practice on the mat. We practice courage, we practice effort, we practice like um, going outside of our comfort zone and then we can bring all of that into our work. And I think that's very useful. I think that's so true and such a good point that you say that kids get put in boxes And I remember there's an English Mm -hmm. journalist called Caitlin Moran, and she said when she was growing up, she used to think of herself as a brain in a jar because she's like, okay, if I'm not the athlete, then I will just be the smart one and I'm the writer. And she just walked around thinking of herself as the brain in the jar and her body was just this thing that came along with her. And Mm. I think it was only until her 40s or her 50s that she got into yoga and just thought like, I've kind of missed out on this all along because I separated my creativity from my body. And I think that's what's so fascinating. And and the people I try to interview in the club, 
are these multifaceted women who do have their sport and do have that kind of like whether it's surfing or snowboarding or just a movement practice or training but also you often find like yourself they have this creative side of them as well and also this really intellectual side this really like business minded side and it's almost just encompassing how we are mm-hmm. so multifaceted. We are not just one thing because it's so true how you see people kind of limited to the athlete or the smart one. And it's not that simple. And all of these things can kind of work together and it should all work together. Our body should be a part of this. Absolutely. Our body has this strong intelligence that we don't always pay attention to. And that's something that I've re- very connected to. In the past year, I know we're going to dive into it a bit more, but I went through a big trauma and a a massive life experience and people were pushing me to going to talk therapy. And I was like, I don't want to repeat every single week, everything that I've been going through. I'm able to communicate it, but it's stuck in my body. I need somebody to help me release all of these emotions from my body. And I was able to do it alone, but in, when you're weak or you're physically very like weak is, is, is the right word, you need maybe somebody else to help you through that. So I think our body holds so much and we pay so much attention to mental health and that's amazing, but also to reconnect that part and know that our bodies hold so much information that we can connect to through movement. And then it helps us in our relationship in our creative practices and everywhere else. Totally. And it reminds me of something I was listening to by Esther Perel, the the relationship psychologist, and Mm. how for a lot of men, obviously stereotyping, but for a lot of men, their language is through the body. And for a lot of women, it is through talking. And sometimes Mm. you won't always get to the resolution, like you said, by talking about it, writing about it, intellectualizing about it. There is that piece, but there are so many other methods for getting through things for having the courage to like have resilience to to deal with things. And that is where the body and this relationship with our body is so important. That's a very good point. Like we speak different languages, but we're not always aware of it. And I think getting on the mat and practicing, I say that all the time to my clients that they're practicing resilience. And I think for some people, they're like, what? Because they they think everything happens in the brain and you have to be mentally strong. But I, I do really believe that we, when we practice endurance training, we become more resilient without being fully aware of it. But it just, your body picks up on it and knows how to be uncomfortable and knows how to push through and knows how to come up with solutions. And it's just, yeah, I, I really like this language. I really like connecting everything together and seeing, yeah, I just, I like to look at the whole picture, whether it's for me or for the groups that I'm training with or just my friends or everything. I just, I really love this thing that this like ever going curiosity about ourselves. And I've noticed sometimes when I'm training, like physical training, it almost opens up this vulnerability where I start hearing these like negative voices in my head. And it almost sounds like, I don't Mm. know, like, like high school kids or something. And it's like, where does this, where did this negative dialogue unlock somewhere in my body because I'm pushing myself. And so it just shows that, like you said, this curiosity that is just endless, like the stories our bodies hold, the the memories they hold and and how they can come up in Mm -hmm. in different examples. Mm -hmm. The more we practice, the more we release and mostly like a hip. I was doing a hip mobility class a few weeks ago and one of my clients just wrote, it was online and she just wrote, I don't know what happened, but I ended up crying on my mat. I was just like, that's great just like releasing we don't need to intellectualize it we don't need to understand it it happened and we move forward um so yeah that's something that I really love about being a movement teacher Mm, I think that's really beautiful and you mentioned you went through a trauma recently in past years and I would love Mm. to start talking about that if you're comfortable kind of what were your priorities what was the Mm -hmm. pace of your life before and then what kind of Mm. happened from there Yeah, um, that's interesting to go back to the before because it's almost as if it gets erased. It's there's there's such a strong division between the before and after the event, and after you try to survive so much that you kind of erase what was happening before and that you had a life before. So it's 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 so strange to go back to it, but 
So before everything happened, I was living in Montreal in an apartment with my boyfriend. Everything was going well. <laughs> I was... <clears throat> Um, the world was opening up again. It was the beginning of 2022. Um, we had it very hard, the, the COVID-19 pandemic in Quebec. Everything was closed for so long, for months and months and months. And we had a curfew and it was extremely restricted. So the world was finally open up again. And I was a solo traveler. So I was planning new trips and I was going back to work. Um, the television industry stayed on during the pandemic. Um, but we were all working in our little apartment. So I was going back to sets again um, and everything was do going well, but I was also longing for more. It was also a chapter of my life where I was just wanting more everywhere. I wanted more. I, wa I wanted to move out of the apartment and buy a house in nature. I wanted a baby because all of my friends were having babies around me. And I was like, Maybe I should be doing that too, to still connect and share a similar experience with them. And it was not happening for us or it was not the right timing for us. And at work, I, I felt like I was not doing enough and I could, I could play so much bigger. I felt like I was playing small. So I was going through my life and everything was going well on paper, but I was longing for more in my heart. Um, and then I fell. I fell on a TV set, um, such a ridiculous event but I just fell and I ended up on crutches for months and I had to relearn how to walk oh <laughs> so as the world was opening up again I was like again like on my couch um for months just having so much time to think and I think that really fueled this these big reflections of like wanting to flip my my life around just because I was again stuck at home thinking And then when I was finally able to walk again and regaining freedom and planning a trip, I found by myself, I found a tiny lump in my left breast and I went to a doctor right away and I was told that I was very young and it was probably just a cyst and I was sent home. But to go back to what we said about our body's intelligence and being connected to our bodies, I just knew, I just knew I was sick. I just knew something was wrong. So I took everything in my own hands, but I was also paralyzed by fear. So my partner, Daniel, also helped speed things up. And we saw another doctor and I went through a bunch of testing. I did a biopsy. And the next day I did the biopsy, I flew alone to Mexico. <laughs> Because I was like, if something's happening, if I'm sick, I won't be traveling for a very long time if I'm ever traveling again. So I went and I went traveling by myself. I went like in a, in a tiny village in Baja. I was doing yoga every day. I was trying to stay calm. And then one morning, I was going to the same yoga studio every single morning that was right next to a coffee shop. And I went to the coffee shop that morning. I was standing in line and I felt a hand on my shoulder, which I recognized right away. And it was my partner, Daniel, who had just jumped on the flight to Mexico, found me. I still don't know how. I think he knew that I was going to a yoga studio right next to a coffee shop. And he asked the cab driver, like, these are my clues. And I know she's in that village. Could you help me find that place? And I looked at him and I just said, I have cancer. And he said, yes. So he had gotten the call the day before and he could not tell me on the phone. So he just jumped on the plane and told me in person. And it's really, it's really like they show you in the advertisement when like you feel like you're falling backwards or like the floor is opening under your feet. It's really, I, 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 Remember like looking at myself from above and thinking, oh, it's really like they say, it's really like they say, you just, you feel like your world is just shutting down. Like everybody around me was blurry and everything felt dark and strange and in slow motion. And then we sat down and I called my parents. I called a few friends. We spent the night together. And then the next day, I was supposed to, I had booked this crazy resort that was only accessible by boat with Erika. And I decided to go <laughs> anyway. <laughs> so I just jumped on that tiny boat with Erika. 
And we just went for a few days because anyway, I didn't have my, my cancer team just yet. They were trying to like build my, my team. And, and then as soon as they had it, they would call me. Um, so I decided that I would stay up until I had my appointment. And then I would fly back to Montreal as soon as I had my date, which ended up being like five days later. So yeah, that's, that's what happened. And then for five days, I was just trying to process, but it was odd because we were in this like fantastic resort, like high up in the mountains with the sea in front of us. Everybody was on vacation and I was just trying to process that my life was about to be forever changed and I did not know if I would survive. So it was all very strange. Um, I think it was very strange for Erika as well because she didn't have a vacation for a long time and she was coming in this mindset of celebration and celebra celebrating her successes for Salty Souls and for herself and everything that happened in the last few years. And she finally had a downtime to celebrate everything and my life was falling apart. So we were standing at very, like just at polar opposites. Mm -hmm. So that was a very strange trip. And then I ended up coming back and entering into this year journey of chemotherapy, surgery, radiation, and, and then slowly gaining my, my health back. I was, um, I had an, an extremely aggressive form of cancer, but it responded extremely well to treatment. So I'm now in full remission. I have a cute haircut. I'm back to working. <laughs> so now things are good, but, uh, it was hell <laughs> for, for a bit over a year. I imagine. And I imagine it completely changed the dynamic of your relationship as well. Mm hmm. It did because as soon as um, as soon as you get these news, your partner is yes, your partner, but also your caregiver right away. Um, and we had been together for two years, but we had known each other for eight years, I think. So we were very comfortable with each other, and we knew that we could get through it. But I really understood why so many relationships fall apart during this journey because. It's extremely demanding and we really felt as if we were now living on a desert island. It's just, it's just, it's you and I. And um, yeah, so that's very strange, this dynamic of um, I'm a girlfriend, but I'm also, I'm also something, I'm also someone very sick and getting weaker and weaker that really needs help with everything. So you really rely on your partner. That's very demanding on them. Um, so yeah, it really changed the, the dynamic forever, I think. And I think you either then stay together because you went through hell and you survived or you pathways because it was so hard and you just are in need of some lightness. So it's, yeah, it, it really changed the dynamic forever. And for us, thank God for the best, but it was, and it's still hard. It's still hard coming back from it. Mm. So yeah. Mm -hmm. It's a hell of a journey. Oh, I imagine. And also, you know, everyone was shut down for so many years. And then, like you said, you were coming out of pandemic mm -hmm. and that was everyone was breathing a sigh of relief. And then you got an injury where you couldn't walk. And then soon past that, you got cancer. It's like this endless winter. Like, you yeah. know, I think it's very easy when, like, life is going fast and say you get sick for, like, a short amount of time. You get a cold and you're like, it's okay, like. I'll stay in bed for the week and this will be my inner winter. But to have this endless inner winter and self-introspection, like, it must have been really intense. It's really intense and it's really hard not to feel that it's unfair because going through cancer is big enough, but then four months after my diagnosis, my dad was diagnosed with cancer and I'm an only child. Um, so we were like thrown into this endless loop of just bad news and big struggles, extreme challenges. But then next to me, my friends were giving birth and starting businesses and traveling and getting married and all these things. And it's really hard to not feel as if life has punished you. And one of the, the people that I connected with to help me um, kind of a therapist, but it was really based on, it was also very physical, like feeling stuck in your body and just, uh, it's, it's, it's very hard to explain. But in one of our sessions, 
I was saying that I felt guilty about feeling that all of this was unfair because I knew that it was not productive to, th- to think it's unfair. Why me? I know that it was very low vibrations to think that way. So I was also guilty about feeling that it was unfair. And it was like these like many layers of negative emotions. And he told me, it's as if you went into a rave and said, it's not very quiet in here. It would be true, but it doesn't have to be. It's not the purpose of a rave to be quiet, but you're not wrong. But it's just, it doesn't, that's not the purpose of it. So you can say all you want that it's unfair, but it's not the purpose of it. Yes, it's unfair, but it's not productive to think that way. So it was very hard to come out of that loop, but that image really stuck with me because, yeah, it's unfair, but like bad things happen to good people all the time. Um, And some days I would just be stuck in this darkness of just feeling that it's unfair and that yeah, I, I felt punished. And then some other days I was like, I was, I was feeling solid enough to think about the big transformation that was happening within me and in my world, because it also affects your inner circle in massive, massive ways. So I was just, another image that helped me was just imagining everybody going into this spiral of evolution and change and transformation and coming out of it with a new pair of eyes. And that was something that I, that I held on to many times to think about, okay, we're just going through this. It's big transformation. And cancer is massive in terms of transformation because it's not only, it's not only happen, happening in your inner being, it's happening physically. So it really forces you to let go of everything you once known. It's just like, now open your palms. We're just going to take everything from you and start from scratch. Because so it's, it's, it's really demanding to just accept that big invitation. But seeing it that way really helped me accept it. It was the only way for me to accept it. Totally. Really, I think. And I think we, we read about surrender all day long, but true surrender, I think, must be, you know, I can, I feel like I've only really experienced it truly once in my life with like pregnancy and like having my baby and stuff. But I think true Mm. surrender is one of the hardest things to do. It really had to be forced on me (laughs) for me to surrender because (laughs) I was having like, I was someone having a really hard time letting go of things before I even went to Peru and did ayahuasca for a full week, trying to learn how to let go. And it was a complete failure. I hated it really did not like my experience with that plant at all. (laughs) Still could not let go after this experience. So when it was forced on me, I had to, I had to do it. And it ended up being quite freeing in some way. It was hard and I, I didn't want, I didn't want it, but it ended up being freeing. And like you said, it's not just your, your inner like feeling. It's also your outward appearance, like things like losing hair you know I I imagine we don't realize how attached we are to our hair and what it means about us and what it makes us feel about ourselves how was that experience Mm. I was fully aware of how big it was for me because I was obsessed with my hair I was obsessed with like making my hair grow and not touching it and I was I think I was also hiding behind my hair. I had long, thick hair. And I think it was, it was not the best. It was not the most beautiful, but I was just like so attached to my hair. I think it was also a symbol of my feminine side and feminine energy. Um, So I did everything in my power not to lose my hair, which is so silly when I think about it. But there is this thing called um, cold capping. And you just put this cap that's refrigerated to minus 35 degrees on your head for like eight hours straight and you have to change it every 20 minutes and it's supposed to freeze your head so that the chemo doesn't go to your head so you keep your hair i'm explaining it in a very poor way right now but you can look it up cold capping Um, and it really requires your partner to be part of the process because they need to, they need to wear gloves because it's so cold and they need to have a, 
a thermometer to make sure that it's not too cold, but not too warm. But because if it's too warm, it's not going to work. And I was just like so obsessed with that process. And you cannot wash your hair. You have to pour like very little water on your hair or else it's going to fall. You can't move while you sleep. I was just obsessing over not losing my hair. But I was also going through chemo. I was nauseous. I was dizzy. For the first few days after every treatment, I couldn't very couldn't walk by myself. I needed help with everything. So to top that with the stress of not losing my head, my hair <laughs> and my head was completely insane when I when I think back of it. And it's one of my friends that called me one night and just really invited me to let go. She was like, choose your sleep, choose your wellness, choose your peace, open your palms, let go. You will sleep so well and it will regrow with like brand new hair, strong hair. Just visualize it. Just let go. And the next day, my parents and a few close friends came. We did a little ceremony and my boyfriend shaved my head. And I thought I was so beautiful. I thought it fit me so well. I have a perfect round head. And I was like, oh, like that it's feels good nice. Because no one ever knows. And I, I I too. <laughs> yeah. No one ever knows. So I discovered that I had the perfectly round head and I slept so well. And it was just so nice not to care about my hair by going through this difficult treatment. Um, But that was extremely difficult for me. And then you lose your eyelashes and your eyebrows. And it's just like everything that, everything that makes you in big quotation marks, everything that makes you beautiful as a woman is just taken from you. And plus it's breast cancer. So it's also like your, your, you get injections all the time and people squeeze your breasts and they, and you're naked on tables all the time. And it's cold and like many like strangers look at them and pinch them. And just, it's just like, it's so, oh, it's so inhumane. And it's so, it, you really feel, I really feel like a, a lab mm -hmm. rat for this whole process. Mm -hmm. So that was really hard to reconnect. I'm still on the process to reconnecting with my feminine mm -hmm. energy. And I imagine this sense that your body belongs to you as well, when so many people are touching it, pulling it, pinching it, you know. Exactly. I felt like my, I gave my body to science and it was not mine anymore. And it was always painful. And it was always, it felt always so weak. So it's really hard to... Um, you know, some people say you fight against cancer, which is something I'm strongly against because it's happening in your body and it's a massive teacher. But I do understand because it requires some sort of combative energy in the, the hospital world to just stay strong and ask questions and say no when it's too much for you and just stand strong in your beliefs and stand strong in your, in your faith that you'll be fine. Even if you say no to that part, because it's too much for you or you push it back or so it requires some sort of combative energy, but I don't feel like you fight against it. I think you have to live with it, accept it and trust, but it's, oh, it's just, it's so hard. And it's such a long process to just undo everything that's been done to you in the hospital. Yeah, exactly. And then I imagine you are still untangling so much of what happened mm -hmm. and what you went through. And, and I think it just touches on this thing of having all these markers of our identity just completely taken away from us. And then who are we then when, we, when our body is weak, when we don't have our hair anymore, when we can't move like we're used to moving? I mean, what can you do when you're in that? Yeah, it's so odd because who are you anymore? You're taking out of your work world you're not working anymore you, you can't move you don't look like yourself it's very odd the the it's very odd you really feel like your identity just dissolved and it's just not there anymore so what is left and I did two things I made my world very tiny so I was only speaking to my boyfriend my parents and really close friends close friends that could be uncomfortable seeing me that way and just stay with it and friends that could have tough conversations and friends that could ask me how are you without feeling scared and projecting my experience onto themselves 
So I made my world very tiny and I knew I was surrounded by people who knew me for who I was. Not in the work world, not in the fitness world, not in the TV world, just who I was. And that really helped me connect with who I was under all of these layers. And then I started doing like Pinterest boards, <laughs> just like collecting images and words. And I was also writing and meditating about what I wanted my world to be after, what stayed and what is no longer necessary for me on this journey. And when you are in a deep suffering, I think you realize everything you are more than ever. I think I gain more self-confidence on that journey than anywhere else before because you realize, oh, I, I have resilience. I have gained wisdom in the past decade. I have gained, I am comfortable in the unknown because I decided to solo travel all over, all over the world and start a business and just I survived other struggle and other challenges. So you really, it's just you and your little toolbox. So I gain a lot of confidence in myself. I did not know what I was going to do with all of it, but I knew I was going to be fine. And then the question of identity became less about image and status and more about inner trust and inner wisdom, if that makes sense. So it was really a journey from the inside out. Mm -hmm. And it made me realize how much we pay attention to the outside world. That's exactly what I was thinking, the fact that you made your world so insular. And I wonder if that was the first time that you weren't receiving so much information from the outside world. And I think it's so great that you did call on friends who could sit in the discomfort and could really be mm -hmm. there for you. And like you say, not project themselves onto you or make it about them. Because mm -hmm. I think that's what happens a lot in, in like sicknesses or like deaths or disasters is people make it about them. Yes. And I don't want to say the wrong thing. And like, it's just that's not how you support someone. So the fact that you kind of sat with people who cared about your essence, right, and they cared about who you are as a person, all this other stuff didn't matter. It's just they just wanted to sit with you. Um, and I think that's so important. And we don't get an opportunity for that. We don't give ourselves that opportunity a lot in our lives. And I think especially in this stage of our 30s where it feels like everyone's constructing their lives, but it's almost just like a it's almost just an illusion, right? It's almost giving ourselves this sense of control and, and building this life that we think is going to be fixed. Because as we know from our friends who are like 50 and 60, like a lot of what we're constructing right now isn't what's going to be the reality in 30 years from now anyway. So it's almost this illusion of security. But in this, this stage right now in our 30s is when I think it's really like hyper like prevalent around us even more with social media because then you're seeing hundreds of people, thousands of people your age, not just like before when maybe it would be your neighbor and you're looking over the fence a bit like, what car have they got? Mm -hmm. What are they doing? It's so intense seeing what everyone around you is doing. You're so right. The, the 30s are hard for that reason. You're in this age of building But is it really coming from you and your desires or is it, I feel like sometimes we're looking at social media and we're thinking, oh, so this is what we're doing. Perfect. This is what we're doing. We're agreeing on this. Perfect. We're doing this deal. And then everybody starts doing the same thing. And it's, it's so present in our lives that it becomes not even part of our conscious mind. It's just something we do. But then when you're one way to explain how I was seeing the world to my friends was saying, I feel like I'm looking at all of you from the outside. I'm looking in a bubble and I, I'm completely outside of it now. I'm looking in, but I'm not part of it anymore. And I do not know how to come back. And I do not know if I want to, but I really feel like now that I've been pulled away from everything, I'm looking at it from the outside and I find so many things that were so important to me, very silly. <laughs> And very funny yeah. and just unimportant. I'm just like, oh, that's so cute that they really want that thing to put into their garage or put into their homes. And just like, it's really important for them. I really feel like I'm looking at it from the outside. It's so strange, but also very liberating. Like I was saying before, it's freeing also to get out of it and not feel like 
you need to do the same thing. It can be a lonely experience. I think I, it's, it's odd because I felt like I wanted to connect with other young women going through cancer because you're going through the same thing. But at the same time, you want to get out of it. You don't want to stay into that world. So it's, it, it's lonely because you don't feel like you connect as much with people that did not go through the experience. But you, I know that I did not want to stay too close to the people that went through it because we all go through it differently. And I felt like some people were just keeping me in that realm of you're sick, you know, mm -hmm. when as soon as I had one chemo treatment, I was like, I'm healed. I'm going to go through the whole process, but I'm healed. I felt like very strongly that it was just gone. So yeah, it's hard. It's hard to find your place into the world after all of it. It's mm -hmm. really, it's odd. Yes, because I imagine like on this, this, okay, where can I land my identity on now? Oh, okay, here's a group of people and we can support each other because maybe we do understand what each other's been through. But like you said, everyone's experience is so different. And also if that is the main factor that binds you all, where is that, what is a healthy amount of calling on that community while also not completely now identifying with that community? And like you said, kind of staying there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's very odd. Also teaching groups uh, in my movement classes, I find that I have now way more empathy for people and I think I've attracted this kind of new clientele of people that went through massive trauma trauma with a capital T that just came to my classes because they knew I could understand what they needed or what they went through even if it was a complete different experience you just connect with this idea of your world shattering and having to rebuild everything and I had strong empathy for them but then I used to be also empathetic to my clients who um found a movement difficult or wanted to slow down or wanted to and now I'm like no well a little discomfort is going to do you good you just were pushing through it just like come on you it's yeah. not that hard it just like so I'm trying to still find my balance between still being empathetic for people who are just anxious because they're anxious mm -hmm. even though nothing bad had ha have happened while also holding space for people that went through massive events and know that I now have a baggage that allows me to connect with them but I do feel like I have a lack of empathy now and it's something I'm working on for people who are just anxious mm -hmm. for no reason or not being able to be uncomfortable when it's a privilege to feel pressure and to feel stress and to feel uncomfortable and to choose it still I still feel so odd I still feel like I'm trying to find my my place but I also feel like it's good for people to gain perspective and to yeah you know, just like gain a bit of distance with their experience and and know just how good they have it and that if not if something bad happens to them but it's just when like we're getting older life's getting tougher we see like more we're more in touch with death with diseases with tragedies with the climate crisis, everything, it's just going to get tougher with age. So we need to be able to be really uncomfortable and accept the invitation to transform. But it's, it's not easy for, it's not easy for everybody. And I get that because I was really, I was hanging on to my comfort before everything happened too. So I get, I get that it's very hard. Well, thanks for sharing that and that honesty as well, because I think sometimes there's this expectation <laughs> when people come out the other side of trauma to be these little Mother Teresas who are all, and then I think it's great to share that rawness where sometimes <laughs> you're like, just get the fuck over it. Like, it doesn't matter that your car broke down, you know, <laughs> like, and I get it. I get yeah. that sometimes it must be like, you don't understand like how insular you're being right now and that this, this, and that's yeah. what I want to talk about too is like, you know, after usually there's like a disaster or a, or a death or like a sickness or something, there can be this feeling like of just fuck it, like this doesn't matter. And so many of the things we worry about yeah. don't matter. And then, but then there's this push pull where we still have to show up to work and we still have to like be members of a civilized society. I mean, when I was 22, I had a friend pass away, but I had no responsibilities. So I quit everything, moved to the other side of the world and like partied and surfed for two years. But at 30 with a kid I can't do that you know and, and we can't I, I don't think that's yeah. necessarily the healthiest thing to do anyway so it's like how do we kind of step out of this because each experience we have like you said it's coming for all of us whether it's our close friends whether it's us it's our family yeah and each time something like this happens where it just gives us this perspective of like what doesn't doesn't matter it's like how do we hold this almost like lightness 
of like letting go of all these tiny little things that used to bother us, but while also being like, we have to pay our bills, we have to pay our taxes, we have to be members of like a civilized society. We can't just say fuck it and go to Central America every time something happens. Sometimes we can, a lot of the times we can, but what, how do you kind of hold that sort of duality there? That is such a great question. And I'm exactly like you. One time in 2019, I was sitting in a meeting and I really felt like I was at the boys club. And even though I was part of the creative team, I felt like all the men there were just looking at me as the girl is going to make coffee for them later. And I just picked my credit card and I booked a flight to Australia and I just left. I left everything I left. And it's not something I could do right now that I'm a homeowner and I'm in a relationship and all these things, but it is hard to reconcile. Mostly that I work in the TV industry. It's so not important. It's entertainment. So sometimes I sit in meetings and I want to say, we don't care. It's not important. It's not something we should care about right now, whether this is funny or whether we should like do that, that joke or not, you know, like all these things. So It's hard to reconcile for me, but I do have to say that I changed my life. I left my apartment in the city where I I felt like people were sweating the small stuff way more. And I bought a house in nature and I started doing cold plunge and waking up in silence and in the sunlight and reconnecting with nature in a more profound way and just handpicking projects that I really want to do and really making time for my friends and nourish my relationships and finding a business model that allows me to drop everything if my friend needs help with her baby so I just can up and go. So health and relationships have become, and nature, have become the three anchors, the three more important things in my life. And the rest, sometimes... A job can be just a job to bring money in. And it's not something that I could reconcile before being sick. I felt like every single project had to be life-changing and purpose-driven and really important. And now what's really important is staying healthy and being there for my friends and being there for my partner and being there for my family and spending time in nature, and really learning about our natural world. And then the rest is going to come. I'm still like creating the next part of my career because I have to do something meaningful. But at the moment, I'm just trading water. I'm just like paying the bills I need to pay while creating a life and a vision that aligns with my newfound values. So it is a dance between holding the vision and just doing what we need to do as adults. But I think um, I think giving the small stuff less importance and giving the real stuff way more space and time is a way to find my balance between it all. Does that make sense? I'm still reflecting all, on all of this, so I don't know if I have an answer that's, that feels complete just yet. It makes total <laughs> sense, and I like that you're honest about that it's still – your new life and your new direction is settling around yeah. you because we expect everyone to be so um, destination oriented and to know exactly who they are and what's next. So, you know, just every time sh- someone shares, I'm still figuring it out. That's perfect. Yeah. And I think that's what more people need to hear. I bought a t-shirt. I bought, I bought a t-shirt that's the, that says, I'm still figuring it out on my back because people were quick to ask me, what are you going to do after? What are you going to do next? And it's like, I don't know. I have a fresh new pair of eyes. I have. I feel like I have a new brain. My body works differently. So I don't know. But sitting with that is very hard when you're 34 because you're supposed to have it figured out. And that's something that I, I'm really still working on. Isn't it crazy when we were younger how much we thought 34 was like a lady, you know, how much mid-30s oh. was, that's when you've got it sorted. And now that we're all there, it's like... The big oh, house, three kids, mm-hmm. absolutely, absolutely. Yeah, time is getting very strange. And yeah, it's, I feel like time speeds up also as we age. Um, one of my favorite authors is Jedediah Jenkins. And he did this TED talk about time and he said that there is a time to 
there is a way to slow down time when we're adults because he says like when we were kids, like a summer felt like three years. Like I remember, I remember feeling like it was so long before I was going back to school and feeling excited about September, but it was never coming. It was like summers were so long and now it's like eight weekends and they fly so fast and then it's fall again. And in Quebec, we have these like strong, like four seasons. So like summer doesn't like extend its legs way more than it needs. It's just like September, it's fall now, it's over. And it passed so quick. And he was saying that the way to slow down time is to keep doing new experiences and keep throwing yourself in the unknown and keep learning new things because then your brain slows down and needs to integrate new information and process it and just be in awe of something new. And that's something that I want to keep create space for in my life because when we're stuck in routines and the weeks fly by, we don't really see our life go by. And when you're, you're told at like 32 that you'll probably die soon, it's just like it really reshapes your relationship to time. So that's something I try to do. It's not always easy in, in our fast-paced society, but that's something I try to do to create space for new learnings and new experiences to slow things down a little bit. Totally. And also for our relationships as well, like how easy it is to just get into that monotony of a relationship and the safest thing is to watch a TV show. And next thing you know, it's like, oh, we haven't seen the face. Like I haven't seen your face trying something new for so long. We haven't done something like that together. So, I mean, developing with ourselves, but also developing with our partners as well is how important it is to be growing and trying new things together. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We're, in, we're in deep into that right now because we, we bought a new house. So there's so much to do. So the weekends fly by because there's always a project that we to accomplish in the house. But we had this conversation last week, like we need to create space to just be and be together and experience new things and go on this new hike, like in our new area and create space for romance and create space for just being together without having always something to do. Like the, the to-do list is endless. So we have to stop it ourselves. But it's just, it's, it requires effort. It really does. Mm -hmm. That's it. And no one's going to slow it down for us. I have the same with my partner because we mm -hmm. have a house that we're working on. And it took us a long time to be like, every weekend can't be about projects. Let's just enjoy this house because we haven't actually spent one weekend having our friends over, being in the house. And actually, and before that, you know, it's funny, the house didn't actually feel like ours because we hadn't sat with it yet and just enjoyed it. It was yeah. always like, how much better can this be? What else needs to be fixed? What else needs to be developed? So I think that's really important. Exactly. And you want to do all, you want to fix all these things, but it's like, but I've never really taken time to notice where and when the light is coming through and where do we like to sit the most so we can decide like how we arrange the furniture and what do we need and do we sit on the floor all the time so we need maybe we need a rug and we hadn't thought about it and all these things so yeah it's just like but it's so counterintuitive um in today in our in our in today's society that it really requires effort and i think it also requires having a circle of friends that have the same reflections and also want to slow down time and also want to spend time together on a Tuesday. You know, it's so you don't feel so, so you don't feel like a misfit. So you also feel like, oh, you also want to create change. You also want to do something new. How do you approach it? And it's just, it's so nourishing. Yeah, I agree. When I moved to Guatemala, I, I got a new circle of friends and it was kind of like they did things like bake cookies for each other and Came oh, and that's with so the sweet. gardening. And for me, I had just been like, I'd gone from university partying and then I'd kind of gone into head first wanting to build the club and just being so focused on the club that it almost was like I had to maximize every single amount of time I had, right? And so then having friends who were like, oh, I baked you this just because. I'm like, you invested all this time just Aww. to make me some cookies. And, and so I, I started a garden, which is a new thing for me because I think five years ago, I'd be like, what's the point? I just buy it from a supermarket and it's already there like you know right. why am I gonna wait three months for this thing to grow but mm -hmm. it's this thing of like allowing yourself to have time to waste which isn't wasted but it has slowed down time because I am learning something new in that and it's just so funny thinking about the pace of my life five years ago compared to now 
And I think that's largely due to, yeah, having that community, which is like, yeah, we do pointless things for each other sometimes. And that's that's friendship, you know, and maybe you could spend this yeah, afternoon yeah, yeah. working, but actually I'm going to come bring coffee and let's sit and have coffee together and we're not going to achieve mm-hmm. anything, but you're going to feel supported. I'm going to feel supported. I think my default was like, I have to be working or I have to be, it wasn't this slow blend of like community and that's still what I'm trying to work and what I'm trying to work out too is how do I how do I give back to my immediate community? Because I have friends for them. It's so normal to be like nourishing and giving. That's I don't know if that's because I'm the third child, but for me, it's not. It doesn't come innately to me like to be like, oh, I made this for you, you know. So it's actually something I'm learning from the people around me. You're the me. baby. People were people were giving things to exactly. you. Exactly. You I was receiving. So, so mm-hmm. yeah. And especially in this yeah. culture, I mean, you've spent time in Latin America. I don't know if you've noticed it is a very mm-hmm. giving like community based culture. And, and this thing yeah. of like being an imposition, if someone needs your help, no, someone needs your help. You're not an imposition on their time. Exactly. You need my help this morning. That's what I'm going to do. And of course there yes. needs to be boundaries around that, but there's this almost like flowing, giving, taking thing, which coming from the outside, I had to actually learn because I came from a culture which was very like, how do I optimize time? How do I get there faster? What's going to get me there faster? Absolutely. You know, not that great. Yeah. It really does take a village, not just to raise a child, to heal a woman, to start a business, to like everything, to build a house. It really does. And one, one of my favorite topics, and I'm, I'm glad that so many like TV shows and, and Netflix series are coming out on this right now are the blue zones and why in some parts of the world people are staying healthy over 100 years old. What do they do differently? And the common thread is they live in community. They live, they create space for each other, for conversations, to have coffee. They cook together. They have gardens. So they also in terms of physical movement, like that they have gardens that required a good mobility and being able to bend down and like reach for things and just, and, and they had faith. So they were walking to churches up on the hill every single day and all these things that somehow we've lost, but I find it so um, paradoxical. Mm -hmm. Is that, is Mm -hmm. that the word? Yep. That it's, We're so obsessed with longevity right now in the wellness and fitness space. And it's like, you have to wake up at 4.30 and then do a cold plunge and then journal and then meditate and then do this all by yourself, all alone in your, in your house and then post it so that everybody knows you're better than everybody else. And then that's not going to make you live longer. Like slowing down and, and building your community that will that will help, I think. So I think we have it backwards in terms of longevity. And I think community, it really is a strong thing. And that hit me when I got sick because um, I thought like, it's not your coworkers that will run to you when you're sick. It's your close friends and it's your family. But if you haven't spent time nourishing these relationships, maybe they won't show up. So not to always think about the worst, but it's nice to nourish these relationships when everything is doing well so that when you actually need help from your circle, they show up because it's the natural thing to do and they don't even think twice about it and they have space in their lives to do so. So yeah, that's really something I, I think about. And it's something that when we bought the house, we wanted to be close to friends. Um, one of my best friends just bought a house 10 minutes away. When Erika spent the summer here, she was so close too. So we, we could spend time together yeah. during the summer. And it's one of my, another one of my friends has a cottage here. She has a baby. So I know I'm close. I can go. And it's just, that's something I think about way more when making big life decisions. Totally. Exactly. And I think it's so true what you said. And I see it here. There's every town has a plaza, like has a central park. And at most of these parks, uh, there's still the mm-hmm. pila, which is the giant thing of water where the women wash the clothes every day. And of course, it's it's like largely due to like poverty and that as well. But also there's like 10, 20 women at any one time laughing and talking. And it's part of their routine together. They meet up and wash the clothes together and the kids run around together. And then, you know, the everything happens just so out in the open. You And that's that thing as well as being witnessed in living your life because it's so mm. easy for us to hide in our little boxes. 
because we don't want to be seen as struggling. We don't want to be seen as needing anything. But there's something about having to like live open and grieve openly and like go through struggles openly being witnessed by other people, which almost like restores our humanity and of course would be good for our health. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And and it's not something that's talked about in in the room with your doctor. You never get prescribed like more community time. Yeah. It's really something we have to be aware of by ourselves and just like notice how good we feel after spending a few hours with our friends and just repli replicate that and create space for that. But yeah, it's not it's not easy because it's not taught in schools and it's not suggested in hospitals. It's just something you have to you have to be self-aware about what makes you feel really good and know that you deserve that joy and you deserve that time. Yeah, totally. And also thinking about how they never taught us how to have like conflicts with people or how to kind of share with a friend mm. like look this hurt me like or I hurt you and having these conversations. I mean being being in community is intimate and it's vulnerable and it's hard. You know, it is really hard to have yourself out there like that. But what you get from it is just so meaningful. Yeah. I have this this talk that I give in schools that I talk about their um, digital presence. And I, I'm not telling them that it's bad for them because it's not going anywhere. And our lives are going to be more and more on social media. I just know it. It's not go. It's just getting faster and faster. But I was I was trying to make them aware of when you text with someone or when you converse through DMs, you can always hide true emotions. And you do, and it's way easier to address. It's way harder to address difficult feelings and ask big questions in person when you're face to face with someone. But the less we do it, it's a practice, it's a muscle. And the less we do it, the better we get at it, the worse we get at it. So we really need to practice that and create space for it and just be vulnerable in person and have difficult conversations because. That's how we build long-lasting relationships. I don't think a long-lasting relationship can exist without these difficult conversations or these big emotions. But if we don't learn to sit with that and have it being okay, it's just, I don't know how we're going to not end up being so lonely and just by ourselves. So I, I really try to make them aware of it and encourage face-to-face -face conversations. And I don't know who wrote about this, but um, somebody wrote a book about relationships and was saying that women are really good at having face-to-face -face relationships, face-to-face -face friendships, where their men will have shoulder-to-shoulder -shoulder yes, friendships. Totally. And I thought that was interesting because yep. they will do something together. They'll do sports, they'll go running, yeah. they'll do, they'll watch something. So it's, it's less intimidating because you're not like looking straight into someone where their women will have coffees together and I understand that I'm generalizing but I think it's it's nice to just look at our lives and be like oh do I am I able to have a face-to-face -face friendship yeah. that will last through time no matter what yeah and it's so true I mean that's it guys will like to watch something and that's how they bond and it's funny when my yeah. partner Ugo comes back from seeing a friend I'm like how's his work going how's he feeling about like the baby how's he they He's don't like, know I don't, I don't know I'm like what do you mean they you don't just know. spend all day with him <laughs> 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 I know. So then it's hard because we require that same closeness and that same vulnerability in our relationship. But it's also a practice they have to do with us when we are in a partnership with a man that they have to learn to just sit down. In our relationship, it's it's me that have more struggle with this. Oh, and really? my boyfriend is really good with like staying and staying in the discomfort and just not pulling away. And it's just so hard to do. But the more we practice, the better we get at it. Yeah, I totally agree. Thank you so much for everything we've shared today. It's honestly been just such a really beautiful conversation and thank you for being so open and honest. Um, before we start this, to wrap this up, I did want to ask you, for someone who is going through a massive identity shift right now, maybe a forced identity shift right now, maybe like a big tragedy happened or an illness or something like that, what would be your message to someone going through that right now in terms of like, who am I now? What do I do now? Oh, wow. Um, that's a really good question. Hmm. I think before sharing what you're going to do next, what you're going to be next, I think it requires spending a lot of time with yourself and sitting with yourself 
maybe even creating a, a nice environment, lighting up candles, putting on music, and just letting yourself be inspired by images, videos, poems, anything that just inspires you and take notes of everything that inspires you. It can be colors, it can be destinations, it can be um, the work of a writer and just like, just like start creative vision for your life, for yourself. And again, that can be divided into categories for like relationship, home, um, work environment, career, all these things, health. And then that can be divided into goals. But I think, I think starting big with connecting again to your imagination and possibility, because that's another thing. When you're being put on survival mode and you're told that it's not a guarantee that you will survive, it's very hard to reconnect with the optimism and hope for life. So I think maybe that's a first step to just reconnect with the po endless possibilities and just deserving a grand vision for your life and starting with the creation phase and then, yeah, and then building blocks in the form of goals, little by little, one step at a time. One of my friends says, one potato at a time. <laughs> that can be also useful, but potato by potato. But yeah, so I think that's something, um, yeah, I think that's something that can be fun and useful and also help someone reconnect with their self-worth and self-confidence yeah that's the first thing that came to mind thank you so much MP. thank you so much for this chat today i had the best time talking with you and i can't wait for our community to get to know you as well in the upcoming workshop which we will share about when it's released but just thank you for this morning yes that was so fun. Thank you so much for creating this space for me to chat. And it was so nice to connect with you in, in person. Mm -hmm. Finally, <laughs> finally. <laughs> yeah. <laughs>